So, our next speaker is Jeff Gotthelf, um, and I know him because I have his book, Lean UX. I don't have very many books on UX, um, and I bought this one because it said it's Lean UX, so I thought it might be short. Uh, <laughs> as it turned out, it's not particularly short, but it is very good. <laughs> well, it's not super long either. But the, uh, the thing that I like most about it is it's filled with common sense, and that's not to downplay it. Actually, common sense is a very rare thing. Um, as uh, uh, Mike's talk this morning <laughs> um, uh, kind of underlined as well. And I understand you have a new book out now called Sense and Respond, or is it coming out, or is it no, out, it's out now? It's out now, so go and buy it. And I sense that Jeff will be talking a little bit about that during his talk, Scaling Lean, Principles Over Process. Please give a big hand to Jeff. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. Come on, good afternoon. There we go, all right, all right, excellent, good. Uh, I'm really, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, it's my second time, only my second time in, in Switzerland, which is, which is interesting because I spent a lot of time in Europe. In fact, I live in Europe now, um, and I hope to be back more often, so thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, what I'm gonna talk about in my, uh, in my presentation is uh, how to get designers, product managers, engineers and the business to work well together at any scale. Really thinking about uh, uh, projects uh, at the individual contributor level, at the multiple pro project program level, and at the company level, how do you get people to work well together in a, in a common sense kind of way? In other words, how do you get them to think through um, who the customer is, how to focus on customer success as the main point of, uh, of, of the, the definition of done, if you will, and then ultimately how to get that to incorporate throughout the business? And what you'll see in the talk is that the thing that I like to focus on more than anything is principles. It's the, it's the kind of the underlying values or the, the, the philosophies beneath these methodologies because all too often we get hung up on process and recipes. And so uh, that's what we'll focus on today. But like any good talk, we have to start with a story. And my story starts with my favorite movie. Now, my favorite movie is Goodfellas. And it's a, it's a, it's a tough list. How many of you have not seen Goodfellas? Really quick. Okay, I can't see that many hands. Okay, so a few folks. We, should, we can pause right now for about two and a half hours and just, <laughs> we just watch, put it on the screen. We can watch it. I can tell you every line by heart. Goodfellas is a fantastic movie, a gangster movie from the 90s. Um, and, uh, and this is my favorite scene in the entire movie. So if you haven't seen the movie, um, the, in this scene, uh, you've got uh, uh, Ray Liotta, Joe Pesci, and Robert De Niro, um, who pay a late night visit to Joe Pesci's mom's house. So it's late at night, they're stopping in, and they're stopping in to get a knife. Now, the reason they need a knife is that they have a problem that they need to solve that's in the back of Ray Liotta's car. And they just need that knife, you know, to kind of solve that problem back there. But they stop in late at night to get the knife. And, of course, she wakes up, and it's, it's an Italian household, so she invites them to eat, to sit down and to eat something, and she makes them a meal. Now, throughout the, the conversation in this particular scene, uh, it, it, at some point it turns to uh, a painting that she has painted. And she wants to show them this painting that, uh, that she painted for them. And... Uh, after she shows the painting to the, to the room, uh, Joe Pesci says what I think is probably one of the most famous lines to ever come out of a movie filled with famous lines. And I have the clip here for you, so uh, check it out. Tom, you ever tell you about my painting? No. Look at this. Ah, that's beautiful. Yeah. I like this one. The dog, one dog goes one way and the other dog goes the other way. Well, one is going east and the other one is going west, so what? And this guy's saying, what do you want from me? <laughs> I love, I love that movie. Uh, one dog going one way, one dog going the other way, and gets in the middle saying, what do you want from me, right? And it's interesting because I had, I had what I think, look, I, I think about movies all the time. I love movies. Um, I, had, I had an interesting experience with a client of mine recently which kind of mimicked this particular conversation with Pesci and his mom, right? I, have, I had this client, uh, the situation was a little bit less good, fellas, right? No, no problems needed to be solved in the back of anybody's car, right? But I, I'm talking to a, with, with a client of mine, and uh, we're prepping for an upcoming workshop, and he says to me, he said, look, um, I've, got, I've got my tech teams, right? And they're, I got, I got, they're learning Agile, right? I got one dog going one way, right? And then I got my product teams, 
right? And I'm teaching them lean. I got one dog going the other way. Now, in this particular case, we've got a third dog. We've got the design team, right? And they're learning design thinking. And they got, you know, and they're going yet another way. And, and here I am in the middle asking, you know, which one is right? Right? Like, hey, what do you want from me? I'm teaching everybody the same things. And yet the promise of all of these practices and all of these methodologies working well together doesn't seem to pay off. Right? The cadences don't align. The vocabulary doesn't align. The definition of done or the measure of success for each one of these processes doesn't seem to align. And in fact, what we seem to be causing instead of collaboration and unity is competition. Right? Well, you're not, you're not working in a lean way. Well, you're not working in an agile way. Well, you're not doing design thinking. Right? And it's trying to get these folks to work together in any kind of a collaborative way seems to fail, despite me as the manager in the middle Right, saying, hey, what do you want from me? I taught them the, the latest things, right? Lean, agile, and design thinking, right? The collaboration, the shared understanding that I'm looking for, the increased productivity is nowhere to be found, right? What, what am I supposed to do in this particular situation? Now, the interesting thing is that this particular client was at a big bank, kind of big tens of thousands of employees type of organization. And generally, when you're working with smaller companies, right, startups don't generally have this particular problem, right? And by the way, if you know where this startup is, I want to work here. This is like the coolest conference room I've ever seen. I'm a child of the 80s, so that's perfect for me. Um, startups don't have this problem, generally speaking, right? Because you've got a small number of folks. You have a limited number of people to do the work, right? And so you know the choices that you have to make, and you know the consequences of the choices that you have to make, right? You know who you have to do the work and you know who you don't have to do the work. Um, you know, in, some, in most cases, you know what you don't know and you certainly know how much runway you have. And most importantly, you know what's going to happen if you make enough wrong decisions. So there's no time to debate what process we're actually going to do. Everyone's hustling to get the work done and to make sure that we continue to build the startup. Now, as you start to, to find product market fit and you start to scale and you start to grow, things change, right? In larger and larger companies, things start to change, right? Because all of a sudden, right, you're staring, you're staring at piles of money, right? And with the benefit of scale comes greater responsibility to your team and to the way that you build, to your customers and the way that you build your products, right? You have access to larger teams. You have access to specialists, to special disciplines, right? You have, especially in large companies, you have seemingly endless runway. And, 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 if, and if you make the wrong decision, I mean, there's a slight chance you might get fired, but in most cases, nothing's gonna happen. Right? And because you're big and because you're successful, at this point as an organization, people start to believe that they know everything about their business and about their customers. And so oh, we don't need to continue learning. And so, and so we just kind of keep spinning on, on building more stuff and more stuff and more stuff without actually pausing to see if that stuff has any impact, positive impact, on the customers who buy our products and services. And yet, in these large companies, Right? The language, if you work in a large company, uh, the language, you hear this all the time, we want to be like a startup, right? We want to be lean, we want to be agile, right? It's, it's the, kind of this, this two-headed monster that says, yeah, we, we want to be lean, we want to be agile, but we're big and we know everything, right? We want to be lean, we want to be agile, but uh, we, you know, we, we, uh, we feel like we don't need to actually practice the, the values behind the stuff. We'll just kind of go through the recipes, right? We want to be like a startup. And what's interesting is when they try to take these principles of lean startup and lean UX and agile and design thinking and so forth, and they start to kind of try to apply them to their particular organization, as you stretch them out, they seem to break, right? They, they, they seem, like if, if you read the books, right, if you read the, the, the agile books and, 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 and right, the, the, the focus is on small teams, right, and maybe a handful of those small teams, maybe new initiatives or one-off experiments. But as you start to scale, this kind of stuff, it seems to break. And the question becomes why, right? Why do these processes become so much more difficult to implement in larger and larger companies and in growing companies? And so I set out to answer this question, and I did some research, and by research I mean I asked Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I got some really good answers from Twitter. Uh, in fact, maybe some of, these, uh, some of these will look familiar to you. Um, this is just a, a subset of the answers that I got from Twitter. We already know what we need to do. Why do we need to waste time learning? Right? That's a, that's a popular one. I hear that one all the time. Um, process. Everything has a process, right? This recipes that we have to follow, 85 approvals, and a mysterious they. Right? Blocking anything that's not the old way. I think mysterious they is going to be my next band name. 
We'll see how that goes. Um, to improve that, we need to see a detailed plan and cost-benefit analysis. In other words, I want to see your business plan. I want you to commit to deadlines and budgets. In other words, I'm asking you to predict the future right, in software development, digital product development. Please predict the future. Uh, silos, discipline silos. Uh, no one wants to, to let their, their colleagues go do something that's not in their job description. Um, valuing business need over user needs. Right? We don't really focus on the customer. We're just cutting costs. Um, and then, of course, uh, big companies start to become really concerned about their brand, right? We can't experiment on our customers. We can't run MVPs on our customers. And this is just some of the challenges that I found in my extensive scientific research about why this starts to break. And so I set out to figure out how do we solve this? How do we move these big organizations past these hurdles, right? Because these are, these are the, it's, look, and those, uh, I pick those six or seven uh, responses from Twitter because I hear those all the time and I see those all the time, right? Those, those are the, the, the ones that, that come up over and over and over, regardless of industry, regardless of company size, right? As long as it's kind of high growth to enterprise level, right? How do we move companies past these hurdles? Well, there's a few ways to think about this. And uh, it really starts to think about the different levels of kind of the size and the scope of the work that you're doing. So if you're thinking about scaling at the most basic level, right, you start at, uh, at the project level. And the questions that you have to answer as you start to grow change as the scope of the work starts to, to grow as well. So at the, at the project level, right, the, at the individual project level, the question that we're trying to answer, and this is where all the books usually focus, right, uh, is how do we incorporate more learning, more discovery work into each initiative, right, just to make sure that we're building the right thing. And then you take multiple projects and you scale them out to the program level and the question changes again. The question then becomes, okay, how do we coordinate multiple learning efforts, multiple discovery and delivery efforts focused on the same goal, right? If I've got five teams or ten teams all running experiments, how do we make sure that they're not all running the same experiment, that they're learning from each other, that they're sharing knowledge, that they're building off of the benefits of that scale? And if you take this out one more step, out to the portfolio level, right? So kind of the business line or maybe the entire company level, the question changes again. And the question then becomes, how do we coordinate multiple programs, right? If I've got different uh, projects or different product lines running at the same time, how do I coordinate them? How do I enforce governance to make sure that we stay within legal constraints and privacy constraints and so forth, ethical constraints, right? And then how do we continue to meet shareholder expectations? And the questions become hairier and hairier and hairier. And what's interesting is you start to unpack them even further. The challenges with each one of the, within each one of these levels also starts to get a bit more uh, daunting, if you will. So at the project level, some of the challenges that you're facing in, in answering that question of how do we incorporate more learning are things like this, right? So you've got teams that are optimizing for throughput. In other words, teams that are optimizing for getting features out the door fast, period, end of story. Is it a good feature? Is it a bad feature? Is it well designed? Is it poorly designed? Is it, it doesn't matter, right? As long as we got it out the door and we're increasing our velocity, right? Building some kind of learning efforts into that delivery cadence becomes really difficult, doing that parallel path. And because of that, most teams don't really have any autonomy to make any decisions. Right? They have to ask. They have to go through that 85 steps of approval to make any kind of scope change or any kind of, of change to what they're actually working on. The mindset for teams that work this way is incremental. In other words, they're going to make stuff and they're going to make more stuff, and they're going to make more stuff. Instead of making something and then going back and making it better and making it better and making it better. And then, of course, there's the perceived brand, uh, risk to brand and to current customers. Now, as we start to scale this out, the problems, again, to answering those questions become even uh, more challenging. So at the program level, how do we coordinate multiple teams? How do we make sure that they're sharing the knowledge that they're learning from their discovery efforts so that we're not duplicating efforts? As we start to scale, we inevitably have to start to deal with legacy systems. How do we build on top of those systems? Should we build on top of those systems? Can they do what we need them to do in this modern context? Right? We start to run out of people, and so we either start to offshore to third-party vendors, which becomes very difficult to maintain that kind of collaboration that we're looking for, right, and that kind of cadence, or we start to distribute our teams across campuses, countries and time zones, which becomes even more difficult because when we're working, our colleagues are asleep. And again, that breaks the communication that a lot of these processes teach, right? Lean, agile design thinking teach a lot about conversation. Now, 
<laughs> to make this perhaps even more daunting, right, at the portfolio level, the problems get even greater. Don't worry, the solutions are coming next, right? I recognize the list of problems, right? But here it is, right? At the portfolio level, the problems get even, even hairier, right? So you've got silos, right? Discipline, you've got design over here, you've got engineering over there, uh, product management somewhere else, marketing at a third place, and they don't like to talk to each other. They don't sit together. They don't work together. Or, you know, the, the web team doesn't talk to the mobile team or whatever it is, right? These silos uh, break down the communication that we're looking for in these processes to make them work. Um, IT is a service provider. If you take nothing away from this talk, take this. If you are a business of scale or a business that seeks to scale in the 21st century, you are first and foremost in the software business. Period, end of story. That's the only way to scale and compete in the 21st century. Now, this may seem obvious if you work in a startup or in a tech-centric company, but if you work in a bank or an insurance company or a healthcare company or, 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 or an old commerce company, right, this is still not that obvious. And so we can't put the people who make the website over here right, while the rest of the business runs. Right? IT is not a service provider. IT is how we do business. So we have to figure out how to integrate technology not only into digital product development, but physical product development, HR, finance, marketing. How does it all weave together? And I'll show you how some of that comes together. Um, business value more important than customer value at the company level. Again, very few companies talk about themselves as customer-centric. Right? You hear Amazon say it, right? put the customer first, invent around them, and everything else will follow. Very few companies actually say that. We always talk about margins in the bottom line. Um, annual planning cycles. Assuming we can predict the future, right? We know exactly what will happen in 2018 and how much it'll cost to build software that deals with that, right? Which is, of course, not true. Um, incentive structures, again, focusing on shipping rather than delivering value. Um, governance, we have to comply at the company level with uh, legal constraints, uh, uh, ethical constraints, right? All, all of the IP constraints, that type of thing. And then lastly, um, in our list of problems, uh, is Conway's Law, but in reverse. This was a fascinating one, because this is, this is where companies are actually trying to change, and they can't do it. Now, if you're familiar, Conway's Law says that we build systems that mirror our organizational structures, right? So you've got companies that were designed to operate in a pre-digital reality, and they built systems, digital systems, on top of that organizational structure. Now, they would like to operate in a digital reality, but the, the organizational design doesn't work for that anymore. They can't figure out how to redesign their company to function in a digital space, and I see this all the time. Now, this is a big, hairy list of issues and challenges to scaling these processes. And if you set out in your company uh, or with your teams to solve this problem, you'll find that there are no shortage of recipes right, out there that will tell you how to do agile at scale, lean at scale, right, all of these different ideas. And perhaps, um, you know, you'll, you'll go out there and you'll run, some, uh, you, you'll run some Google queries, and inevitably where you end up as you start to search for is this. <laughs> this is a terrible diagram. Um, it's terrible. Well, you could critique the design choices all you want, right? And I think this guy caught a lot of crap for it. Um, right, it's the, this is the agile landscape overlaid on a kind of a hypothetical London tube map. And every one of the stops along the way here is a, uh, a methodology, a philosophy, a practice, uh, a tool, a technique, you name it out there. And if you're a, uh, uh, a manager or a leader in a company trying to figure out how to bring these processes to scale, and this is where you end up, right? This is probably how you're feeling initially when you look at this, at this, at this diagram, trying to understand, right? And then, and then after looking at it for a while, you're just like this, right? You're like, oh, I can't, right? Like, there's nowhere to start, right? It's more good fellas for those of you who haven't seen it, right? Um, and, and perhaps, uh, <laughs> Certainly is how I felt the first time I saw this chart. I was like, what is this? Right? Now look, perhaps the most popular way of, of dealing with uh, Agile and Lean at scale is, uh, is this. How many are familiar with this diagram? Anybody familiar with this diagram? Nobody? Really? 
There's one guy, one brave person here in the front. I'm, sh- I'm shocked. I'm only shocked because in the United States, at least, at least half, half the hands go up every single time. So what this is, in case you're, and, and I'm sorry to, to bring this to you then. <laughs> I, 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 I probably should have left it at home. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a safe, the scaled agile framework. And this is a, a, the, the high, there's lots and lots of diagrams in this particular methodology. Um, this is the high level diagram that describes the entire process. And this is by far, at least in the United States, the most popular recipe for uh, scaling Agile, right? Every, people are buying this process, they're buying consultants, they're buying certifications, and there is a specific reason why large companies love SAFE. And it's because of this, right? It's because the managers can see themselves in the picture. <laughs> and so they love it. That's me. There I am. I'm at the top. That's where I should be, telling people what to do. Um, the reality is, 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 is it, it, it's half this, and half is because this particular process does not ask leadership to change. Right? It asks all the individual contributors to change the way that they work, but it does not ask the management of the organization, organization to change the values of the organization. And that's the core problem that I want to get at. And I want to get to some solutions about how we start to address the core values that drive agility at scale and lean at scale. And the first thing to remember is that I pick on safe because it's easy and because it's fun and because there's lots of it to pick on. But all of these ideas, safe and uh, you know, lean startup and lean UX and design thinking and, and whatever else and scrum, and, uh, they're all frameworks. They're starting points. They look like recipes, like they should be the destination, but they're where you should, you can start there. That's perfectly fine as long as you learn and you iterate those processes forward. And then instead of scaling the recipe out, what you should ultimately do is scale specific principles out as opposed to the actual processes themselves. Back in 2009, Netflix put out this amazing culture deck. I don't know if you guys remember, it's been God, uh, eight years since that thing came out. Um, You can find it online. And I love this quote from it. It says, process brings seductively strong near-term outcomes. If we only worked in this particular recipe, everything would be fine. And it never works out that way. Instead, we want to look for those underlying principles that drive agility, that drive customer centricity, and that drive continuous learning and improvement. I'm going to give you four of them. Okay, I'm going to give you four specific principles, and I'm going to give you tactics for each principle so that when you go back to work, you'll be able to start applying and thinking through, are we actually living these principles? If you want to, if, you, if those are the principles that you want to live. Now, here's the first one. Principle number one, customer value and business value are the same thing. It seems simple, it seems easy, but it's not. However... If you build products that make your customers successful, that respect their time, that are a delight to use, that solve real problems for them in meaningful ways, they will reward you. They will buy your product. They will buy it again. They will renew their subscription. They will tell their friends. They'll tell their boss. They'll tell the internet. They will reduce your marketing costs, and they will make you successful. Focusing on the customer, making them successful, is the number one principle you should be scaling. If you do that, the process of continuous learning, of discovery, of experimentation, of MVPs, just evolves from that because we have to make sure that what we're shipping is actually making our customers successful. We don't want to ship stuff that makes them less successful. Now, the problem is is that teams tend to remember this, but as you scale out to the program and portfolio level, organizations tend to forget about the customer. And so one really great tool for maintaining focus on the customer is this concept of OKRs. How many are familiar with OKRs? Okay, I've got a few hands in the room. It's tough to see up here. Okay, OKRs stands for Objectives and Key Results. And it's an approach that's been gaining popularity lately um, at Google, at LinkedIn, at General Assembly, and other companies like that. And the focus of this is to uh, frame success as a measure of customer behavior. But there's a, there's, a, there's a business component to it, and there's a measurable component to it, which is the KR piece. We'll get to that in a second. Um, all of this is focused on making sure the customer stays successful. Now, OKR stands for objectives and key results. Now, the objective part of this is a qualitative statement. 
We want to be the best at something. We want to be the most successful. We want to be the biggest, right? Something along those lines, right? It's inspirational, something the whole company can get behind, and it's time-bound. We want to be the biggest e-commerce company in Switzerland by the end of the year, right? That's inspirational. That's something that we can act on as a team or as a company, and we can move that forward. The KR, the key result part of this, is the how will we know part of the conversation. If we say we want to be the biggest or the best uh, e-commerce company in, in Switzerland by the end of the year, how will we know? What will we measure? Right? What are the, the kinds of behaviors that we would see in our customers that would tell us that we are indeed the best, the biggest, or the most successful? Right? And we set these goals, quantifiable, measurable goals of customer behavior at all levels of the company. These are not impossible goals. They should be stretch goals, but not impossible to hit. And if you can set them at the company level, right, at the portfolio level, you can then set them each at the program level. They're all related, and even at the team level. So at every stage of the organization, people are thinking about the customer and how to change their behavior. Now, I realize that's a little bit abstract, so let me give you a specific example. And just, and just you know, again, I wanted to take one from a B2B uh, example as well, just to show you that this, this can work in any situation, not just B2C, in any kind of customer. So here's an, exa an example for an objective for a former client of mine, right? Be the dominant platform for car dealer inventory management by the end of the year. Right? This is what we do. We do car dealer inventory management. Perhaps not the sexiest thing, but this is what we do. And our objective is to be the dominant platform. That's a qualitative statement, right? How will we know that we're the dominant platform? Well, we're going to set one goal, one team, on this first key result. 50% of all independent dealers are our users. That's a measure of customer behavior, right? It's not a list of features to ship by the end of the year. It's a change in customer behavior that we can measure. Now, as a team, you can put a whole team or a business unit on that, and say, look, go figure out how to get people, to st all these specifically independent dealers, to sign up for the service. What do they care about? What are these leading indicators? How do we change their behavior? The next key result, six of the top 10 car makers mandate our platform for their dealerships. That's another piece of the audience. That's a measure of customer behavior. Right? How do we get these folks to change their behavior this way? Right? You're not telling your teams what to build. You're telling them what you'd like to see customers do. And in this case, how do we make customers successful? If we make them successful, they'll mandate that the platform be used in their dealerships. The third example, 40% of auto auction houses using our inventory API. Again, a different audience base. Right? It doesn't tell you what should go into the API, how it should be deployed, who should use it, only that we want to see a percentage of this audience changing their behavior and using our systems more regularly. And at every level of the organization, you've got metrics that feed into this criteria so that you're always keeping the customer front and center of the conversation. Right? There's nothing in here about what we're going to ship, only what we want customers to do. And that's how we start to focus on customer value. Now, here's the amazing thing. If you start to do this and you start to use it on a, on a regular cadence, let's say a quarterly cadence, you can change the speed with which you plan work as well. Remember we talked about annual planning? Let's shrink that down to quarterly planning, right? Because what you're doing every quarter now is you're collecting evidence. If my job is to increase the number of people using our inventory API, then every quarter I get a sense of what's working and what's not. And based on that evidence, I can then plan what I'm going to do next quarter. And what this ends up looking like is this, okay? You take a small team, right? A project team, product design, engineering, QA, marketing, et cetera, right? And you give them an OKR for the quarter, one of those OKRs that I just showed you. Now, for the, full, for the duration of that quarter, that team is learning. They're shipping product, they're running experiments, they're discovering what's working, they're, you know, they're deploying a production-level software that they know will move the needle forward, and they're continuing to, to learn and continuously improve. Now, at the end of each quarter, they come up essentially for what is, what is refunding, Right? At the end of that quarter, they come up and they say to their stakeholders, look, you tasked us with increasing the number of people using our inventory API by 40%. We've been working for a quarter, and we've increased the, uh, the percentage of people by 12%. And here's what we've learned, and here's what we'll do for the next quarter. And then your stakeholders, right, at the, at the portfolio level, have an opportunity to say, 
okay, you've made good progress. I see you've got evidence for funding you for another quarter. Go ahead and then keep, keep working on this for another quarter. Now, the amazing thing that can happen here, so, so what you're doing is, is you're making funding decisions on shorter cycles based on fact, based on customer value that you're delivering based on evidence that the teams are collecting and learning and improving. Now, here's the amazing thing, right? You don't always get to get refunded, right? Sometimes you may spin for a quarter, and you may come up and say, you know what? We're never going to hit 40%. Here's what we learned as a team, and we really should move on to something else. Or you may come up as a team and say, hey, we hit 40%. What do you want to do next? We've got three quarters left of the year, right? It's a tremendous opportunity to reduce the planning cycle here, to put the customer at the center of the conversation and to only ship products that customers actually love, that make them successful, and then ultimately make us successful. Customer value and business value are the same thing. Principle number two, as an organization, as a team, as a program, you have to value learning over delivery, right? Getting product to market is the first step in a conversation with your audience. It is not the last step. Learning which products to spend your time on and to what extent they should be invested in is more valuable. Right? The challenge here, again, for most agile teams, is that they get measured to velocity. And so what you get is teams that are trying to maximize their velocity of delivery, and they have zero velocity of learning or discovery. Right? And our goal is to increase the amount of learning that they do. Now, inevitably, as you increase the velocity of learning, the velocity of delivery is going to come down, and that's going to piss off some managers along the way. Right? So we have to figure out where that balance is because learning tells us what we should build. Now, how do we do that? How do we start to value learning over delivery? Well, I'll give you two tactics for this. The first and foremost is this. Start, if you're not already working this way, start to build momentum for this effort with pilot teams. Pilot teams are small, experimental teams. Their goal is to learn. Their goal is not return on investment. Uh, their velocity will inevitably be slower, and that's okay. They're figuring out how to do product discovery, how to do lean startup, how to do experimentation inside your company. Align them to a strategic vision and find a champion to sponsor them. Now, what this team is learning is two things. First, they're learning how to do product discovery, how to do experimentation, how to build MVPs and learn from their customers on a regular basis. And the second is they're learning how to do that inside your company, which is different than inside your friend's company and inside my company. Right? And then you can take that learning and scale up a second team and a third team and a fifth team and then a tenth team as you start to build this up. Now, the interesting thing is as you start to scale these pilot teams up, it becomes really difficult to make sure they're all focused on learning the same thing and achieving the same OKR. To do so, what we want to do is we want to align these teams to a single metric of progress. One of the biggest risks as you start to scale learning in an organization, and especially if it's based on OKRs, is you've got this team over here focusing on one OKR, and you've got this team over here focusing on a different OKR. And each one of them is, is, is optimizing locally, and they don't care about the other team. Right? Because their incentive is to get this number up or this customer behavior changed, and it doesn't matter what happens over here. And that's a real problem, particularly at scale. So if you've got multiple teams spinning, we want to give them the same OKR, right? the same measure of customer success, and let them figure out how to collaborate together because they win or lose by the same measure. Right? There's no local optimization. Right? As a team, as five teams, as ten teams, as a program, we win or lose if we hit our OKR together. That's another tactic. One more tactic for valuing learning over delivery. It's very important as you start to scale learning inside a large organization that you deal with governance. Governance right, is particularly problematic in heavily constrained or regulated domains like financial services or healthcare. Right? It becomes difficult to say, well, we want to talk to customers. Right? We want to talk to them about their health their healthcare, which is difficult. Or we want to run experiments on our banking clients. Right? You don't mess with people's money. Right? How, do you, how, how do you do that? Right? And so we have to start to build sandboxes for these teams to work in. Now, technically speaking, I'm sure you all know what, what technical sandboxes are. Right? But I want to talk about governance sandboxes. Right? The actual the regulations that initially tell teams what kind of discovery work they can do. For example, right, starting out with your pilot teams to start to build a culture of learning, especially if you don't have one, is you can say, look, I I'm concerned about you talking to customers all the time, so please don't talk to the same customer more than once a year. Right? That's a sandbox. Um, please don't talk to more than 10 customers a month. 
Okay, that's a good start. It's better than nothing. And then if you can show the value of talking to 10 customers a month, maybe we'll up that to 20. And what we're doing with these sandboxes is we're creating some constraints. And what you'll find with teams that are motivated to learn, that are incentivized to learn, is that creativity actually starts to drive uh, uh, con creative experiments. That, that constraints start to drive creative experiments. Uh, this is my favorite creative experiment that I found so far online. Uh, can you guys see what's going on here? So you've got a team here that needed to figure out whether their contactless credit card would work on a variety of card readers. Multiple times in a row, not just once, right? And so yes, they could have manually sat there and just tapped these 10 readers over and over and over again. Instead, right, because of constraints, they put the card on a model train track and it just goes around past every reader and it lets them know if it's reading or it's not. This is the kind of creativity that comes from constraints. When you build these, these governance sandboxes, your teams will figure out how to get the learning done that they need to get done. I saw a team once um, automate form completion with, uh, oh, what's that QA automation suite? I can't believe I'm blanking on it. Uh, so, so Lara. Selenium, thank you. So, oh my God, total, total brain fart right there. I saw, yeah, I saw a team, like, they, they wanted to automate form completion for their MVP, for their experiment design. They used Selenium to do that for their customers, right? People will figure out, the teams will figure out if you build the constraints for them, okay? So, we've got a business value, customer value are the same thing. We've got value learning over delivery. The third principle I want you to think about is radical transparency. Transparency breeds trust within organizations. And as your organizations grow, the more transparent you are, the more people trust the decisions that you're making and why you're making them. The more that you can let people understand why we've made certain decisions, the more they trust you, the more they get out of your way and let you continue to do your job, whether at the project level, program level, or the portfolio level. And my favorite tactic for building transparency in organizations is rituals. Now, again, as I told you earlier, I'm a child of the 80s, so there's a lot of, uh, and I love movies. Uh, Karate Kid. You guys remember Karate Kid, don't you? Yes? Okay. Karate Kid. So if you don't remember Karate Kid, you got uh, Ralph Macchio, who's now 50 years old, by the way. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and unfortunately, Mr. Miyagi has passed away. Um, but um, you know, Daniel's son. Daniel's son says, look, I want to learn karate. And he goes, he goes to see Mr. Miyagi. He says, I want to learn karate. Mr. Miyagi says, that's terrific. Paint the fence. He's like, but I want to learn karate. He's like, all right, you want to learn karate? Wax my car. <laughs> He's like, but I want to learn karate. Right? What he doesn't get is that by coming in every day and painting the fence and waxing on and waxing off, right? he's learning karate through the rituals. Right? There is value in the rituals that come from these processes that we're trying to scale in organizations. Value in the rituals that come out of Agile, that come out of Lean Startup and so forth. For example, stand-ups. Stand-ups are a terrific ritual to build transparency. Every day, you have to stand up for 10 minutes with your colleagues and talk about what you're going to work on. Right? And believe me, believe me, it gets very old if, uh, for your colleagues to hear, well, today, I'm going to buy a pair of shoes online. Right? And tomorrow, I'm going to uh, you know, place a bet on the horses. Right? At some point, they're going to be like, you're not doing any work. Right? It's these kinds of rituals that, that when we talk about what we're doing and why we're doing it, that give our colleagues a sense of the, of the decision-making process that we're using, and it starts to build transparency inside organizations. Scale that up to scrum of scrums, demo days, um, information radiators, screens inside your office that simply talk about the metrics, how you're tracking towards your OKRs, progress reports, emails. All this stuff helps team learn, teams learn from each other. It shows them what others have done, and they help it use it on their teams. And that says, hey, those guys did that thing, and it worked really well. We can do that too, right? Rituals build transparency and build trust. Another ritual, uh, another way to build uh, transparency is access to customers, right? Exposing your teams regularly to customers, right? Learning comes from the market. And in fact, uh, my friend uh, David Bland likes to say, he talks about MVPs a lot, he said, look, the second hardest thing about minimum viable products is that you can decide what's minimum, but it's the customer that determines whether or not it's viable, right? So the sooner that you can get access to customers and actually talk to them, the sooner you can actually make progress towards understanding whether or not you're working on something of value. 
And if you're working on something of value, that gives you evidence to make better and better decisions, right? And that gets us out of the game of investing, right, um, an unnecessary amount of money in Silicon Valley juicers, right, that you can actually squeeze the juice out by hand, <laughs> right? This is the kind of stuff that access to customers exposes, right? These guys... Uh, that juicer, I don't know if you remember the juicer or thing, uh, got $120 million invested in it. It's a fancy juice squeezing machine with these pouches, and the whole thing can be done by hand. You don't need to spend the money on it, right? Access to data also builds transparency, right? I used to work at a company where um, if you wanted analytics information about what was happening with our service, you had to get it in the, in the queue, you had a certain amount of hours that you could only demand of the business intelligence team, and if you ran out for the month, you were screwed, right? And if the CEO wanted data ahead of you, he jumped the queue, and maybe you didn't get your, your data that month. Access to data should be treated like a utility, right? Analytics should be treated like a utility, like the internet, like coffee, like snacks, like Hawaiian shirt Fridays, like everyone should be able to do it. Right? And everyone should have access to it and, and provide them a sense of what's happening and with the access to customers, why it's happening. And that starts to build transparency into our decision making. So we've got business value and customer value are the same thing. Learning over delivery, transparency. The final principle I want to share with you is humility in all things. This is the key to scaling agility. This is the key to scaling a culture of continuous learning and continuous improvement. Just because we're big, just because we're successful, just because we've always done things a certain way doesn't mean we should continue doing it that way. We need to be open to new ideas. My favorite phrase to describe humility comes from Janice Frazier, who is um, now, uh, she's actually a bionic now, um, Silicon Valley, Adaptive Path, Luxor. Um, she said this, I learned this from her. She said, strong opinions loosely held. I love that, right? We're all smart. We all have strong opinions about how to design, build, ship, market a product, what it should do, how it should work, right? Terrific, lead with those strong opinions. But in the face of evidence, qualitative, quantitative evidence in continuous learning, be willing to change your mind at the, the highest level and at the lowest level. Prove that it's okay to be wrong. The most successful agile organizations have leaders at the sea level who admit when they're wrong. And they move and they change course forward. And there's lots of tactics to do this, right? Um, one of the tactics that I taught in my workshop yesterday was product discovery. Right? Having the humility, humility to say, we'd like to build this product, but we don't exactly know what customers are going to do with it. Amazon Echo. Amazon could have spent 18 months head down writing AI and voice recognition code. Instead, they decided that what they needed to learn first, right? they, they showed their humility, right? was what are people going to ask this thing? And then, subsequently, what's a good answer? And so the way that they did that before they wrote that code, right, is they ran a, a Wizard of Oz experiment where they put the cylinder, an empty cylinder, and a customer in one room, and the customer would ask the cylinder questions, and there was an engineer with a, a computer in another room, and they would run Google queries and then feed those answers back to the customer in the other room just to get a sense of what would people ask and what's a good answer, right? Product discovery breeds humility because you'll find out that you were wrong about your strong opinion, and you'll have to change course. Another tactic, as you start to scale out from the project level to the program level, is changing how organizations support digital product development. Remember, remember we talked about IT as a service, right? No product sees the light of day without legal, without finance, without HR, right? But they're not on our teams. How do we get them to participate in a much more uh, realistic fashion that's at the same, that works at the same cadence as software delivery works, right? Well, there's this concept that we talk about in our new book called the orbital model. The idea is that you've got your core product team, product design and engineering, and they're supported by marketing and HR and legal and finance on a regular cadence, right? You have a check-in with a lawyer for an hour every week. HR checks in on you one, once a month to make sure you've got the right skill sets to complete your work. Finance gets an update from you every two weeks about how the project is doing so that no one is surprised, so that we build transparency and so that we build humility in the way that we work. We've always worked where you know, legal review comes at the end of a project. 
right? But what if we're not legally compliant? Well, six months of worth of work just gets flushed, right? Let's make sure that we don't generate that kind of waste. As we think about humility at broader levels of the organizations, let's think about our staffing models, right? As we grow our companies, we tend to drag product uh, uh, job titles with us that we used to have that don't make sense anymore. Right? Maybe we don't need those jobs anymore, and maybe we can take those folks and put them in more productive roles. I'm going to say a few job titles. Sometimes it gets me in trouble with some folks in the audience. We'll see what happens. Right? But project managers. Right? In a mature, agile organization, project management has less to do. What can we put project managers on to make them more uh, valuable to organizations? Business analysts. What's the difference between a business analyst and a product manager in 2017? Right? That's a good question to ask. So for scrum masters, et cetera, do we actually need those roles or are we just adding bloat and process? And then of course, modernizing the tech stack is absolutely critical. The more you can ship, the more you can learn. And what I'm really talking about here is uh, DevOps, the ability to get ideas into market quickly, to roll them back, to test them, and to move forward. To put, to put this kind of on a, on, a, on a fine point, I stole a couple of slides from my friend Bill Scott, who runs Venmo over at PayPal these days. And he says, look, uh, especially with SAFE, SAFE has this concept of trains that go out, delivery, shipping trains that go out once a month, right? We, 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 we kill this train metaphor, and we talk about a light rail, where we're always, there's always another, de another uh, uh, deployment five, six minutes away. If we miss this one, we'll get on the next one. And these are all our opportunities to learn, right? We start to build a tech stack that allows us to go from prototyping to production without too much work, right? Because if we start to validate that learning, we will move forward. And these are all examples of humility at the project level, at the program level, at the, humil at the, uh, at the portfolio level. So to wrap up, look, if you are a, uh, a manager, I'll tell you this much. Your teams already want to work this way, right? And this is a top-down effort. You have to start creating the kind of environment that supports these principles at all levels. If you're not a manager, find that manager. Now, <laughs> this is what I like to call that manager because that's this manager's job, right? This manager's job is to protect you from the organizational crap that will keep you from working towards customer value and customer success. So find those folks. All right. And so to finally, to final, just to recap the principles, is again, if you're looking to scale Azure, you're looking to scale Lean, scale the principles. Don't scale the process. Customer value and business value are the same thing. Value learning over delivery. Be radically transparent in everything that you do. And lastly, show humility in all Things. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Jeff. That was great. I thought it was a fantastic talk, Thank or you. as Robert De Niro would say. <laughs> That's um, pretty good. So, um, yeah, I particularly like the, um, the London underground uh, map <laughs> of all of the uh, interrelated disciplines. I think I'm going to uh, pin a version of that to my... Um, office wall and then burn down my house. <laughs> uh, there is one question which has just come through okay. um, over the app. So well done whoever worked out how to use that. <laughs> um, and that is, how do you move from only having pilot teams that turn into products being shipped right away, startup which grew too fast, to being sustainable? I'm trying to understand the question. Uh, how do you move from only having pilot teams that turn into products being shipped right away to being sustainable? I think that, the, look, the, 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 and I'll answer a bit generically, and if you, want to grab, if you ask that question, you want to grab me afterwards, I'll get a, a bit more specific if you give me more context. But essentially, the goal is to make sure, like, again, that at all levels, that you're focusing on customer value. Now, it's easy because typically at a smaller scale, you know exactly what you're shipping, what it's going to do. It's relatively focused on a specific customer set to do maybe one thing, hopefully, or a couple of things. As you start to scale, the complexity and the robustness of your offering starts to move, uh, starts to grow as well. And the question is, where do you focus and where do you prioritize? And I think, again, that becomes a conversation on customer value and audience. And we talked about this a lot in my workshop yesterday, is that as an organization, you have to have some kind of strategic vision, right? If you lack that strategic vision, then you, you, so it's like the complexity and the scale kind of goes out in all directions, and you don't know where to focus or where to prioritize because 
you don't have that, that vision, right? If you have that vision, you can, you can clearly say, look, we, we've decided to go in this particular track to focus on this market segment or uh, this product line rather than this for a particular set of reasons. And that at least allows you to say no to a lot of that complexity that comes with growth and a bit more focus on the things that align with your strategic vision. But that was, again, a very generic answer. So if you've got, uh, if you want to ask me afterwards uh, as well. You'll be available be here. all day and in the bar, presumably. Soon, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you very much. One oh. more quick thing. I've got some books to give away. Oh, um, wow, I've got cool. about 20-something 20, uh, 20 copies of Sense and Respond and a handful of Lean UX that I'll be happy to give away. And if you're interested, I'm happy to sign them for you. I think there's somewhere over there. So as soon as I pack up and get off stage, I'm just going to head over there and, uh, and give away a few books. Okay. So if you'd like a book, come on over, and I'd be happy to give you one. Fantastic. Well. Thanks again, Jeff. My pleasure. Thanks Round of applause. Great.